pulls him downstairs and outside. He locks the door and, and puts a big old board across it, and he burns the place down. So old old uh, Jack just looks at him, and he said, and Miller said, well, thank you, sir, and offered him a job. And Jack worked for him for a while, and along the past, the old Miller found him a wife that wasn't a witch. And Jack worked for him for a little bit, got a little money up, and he he told the old Miller, said, oh, well, it's about time I've done grind up enough corn. I think I need to go. And he said adieu to the Miller, and he went off to parts unknown. Now, that's the end of the story. But guess who the old man is? Who's the old man? Well, if you recall... The, uh, with Jack, I don't know if I told you this part, but the Jack tales come from Scottish Irish origins, ancient Germanic origins. So the old man was Odin, the uh, the uh, the old man or the god Odin from Germanic tales. Oh wow! That was that was the uh, old man was Odin. So, oh wow! <laughs> yeah, there you go. So that's that's a little taste of what. Some of my skills come from is telling some of the jack tales. I don't tell them very often. I've got a couple more in my head, but they're not paranormal-ish. Like I've got another jack tale I could probably tell you right now, but it's real quick if you want to hear. Oh, it. go ahead, go ahead, Sean. Kind of funny and weird. Okay. Well, uh, Jack woke up one morning with his mama, and his mama went to make breakfast, and she opened up all the cupboards and checked all the pails and uh, for taters and whatnot and looked at Jack and said, well, we don't have any food, Jack. You're going to have to head to town to find you a little bit of work so you can bring back some food. Oh, Jack, well, he didn't like work at all. Then he didn't like being hungry even worse. So he said, okay, Mama, I'll go off and find some work in town. So he grabs his hat, puts it on, and takes off toward town. And off he went. He got up in the middle of town, or middle of town, he come, walks by this big old uh, wagon. The wagon had a board next to it that fell off of it. He grabs a hold of the board, and he starts wheeling it, and he's making his way through town. And he makes a paddle out of this big old board, and he's swinging it around. He gets up on this old mud puddle, and there's a bunch of flies around it. So he, for whatever reason, he walks up that mud pole and he takes a whack at it. And he whacks it while the flies are around it and pulls it back. And he killed seven of those flies. And he got right proud of himself that he killed seven flies. And he said, old man Jack killed seven in a whack. So <laughs> he, weren't, he runs off and just proud as, as Peach that he did that. And he come upon this old blacksmith shop and went in and started telling about to tell a uh, big old man Jack killed seven in a whack and he talked him out of a belt and old the old uh, blacksmith engraved engraved the words old man Jack killed seven in a whack and he put it around it and old Jack took off of that belt just prancing around in it and he come upon the castle with the king in it and the king met him as walking around his property. And saw that old belt and inscription of it, and old man Jack killed seven in a whack. He said, "You're the boy I need." <laughs> Jack said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah, I've got old lines been pestering not only my grounds but the town and the people likewise. I need somebody like you to go up and kill this line." Well, Jack said, well, "What's it in it for me?" He said, "Well, I'll give you one thousand dollars." Jack said, well, for $1,000, I'll surely kill that old lion. Well, the king got a hold of his horse and put Jack on the back, and they went up to the edge of the woods off the grounds of the uh, the castle. And the king let Jack off the horse and said, the lion's in the woods there. Go and kill it, and I'm going to go back to the castle. You come back with the, the lion's carcass, and I'll give you $1,000. Well, off went the king back to the castle. Old Jack, he wasn't as brave as he thought he was. He said, well, if the king's scared of a, of a lion, I'm not going to have none, no part of this. So he takes off down toward the road to head back home. And as he's running back home, he meets up that lion in the middle of the road. That lion just roaring and carrying on, showing its teeth. 
And old Jack, first thing he thought of was, well, I'm going to jump on, on top of that old tree and shinny up it. Well, he's, he scrambled up that tree faster than any cat you've ever seen. So, he's looking down, and that old lion's just growling and roaring, and he's taking those big old teeth and chomping at that old uh, tree that old Jack's in. Almost cuts down that tree chomping at it. Well, the lion got tired and took himself a nap. And right when old Jackson looked at him and said, well, it's time time to try to get out of here when this lion's uh, sleeping. So he tries to climb down. He gets on a brittle branch, breaks that brittle branch, and down he tumbles, and he tumbles right on top of that old lion. Of course, the lion wakes up instantly and starts trying to bite him and kick him off and buck him off. And old Jack is hanging on for dear life on the back of that lion. And that lion starts taking off and running and jumping and trying to get Jack off. And they head toward town with Jack on the back of this line. And the king caught sight of this sight with Jack on the back of the line coming into town. Well, the king grabs his rifle and he shoots the, the line dead. He runs up to Jack and the line and Jack has this really mad look on his face. And the king says, what's the matter? He said, I'm mad. I'm really mad. You killed my lion. And he said, well, why would you think I'd kill you? I, I killed your lion to save your life. He said, no, I was training this lion so you could ride him. What, be, what fitting mount could you have than a lion for a king? And the old king looked at him. He felt really sorry about it. He, he said, well, I'm going to give you an extra $1,000. He gave Jack $2,000, and he's right happy with himself, and he took off back home and bought his mama the mill of a lifetime. Oh, wow. And that's the story. Wow. <laughs> now, I, I got to ask you a question, Sean. I mean, sure. to get these down so good and smooth, I mean, do you go around in your house talking to yourself with these stories over and over again? Do you get it nice and smooth? <laughs> no, actually, I don't. Sometimes I actually do mess up and I forget. Uh, like if I tell an old, old hell that i haven't told in a while uh i have been practicing because i've got a friend that loves to hear me tell tales and she pestered me okay what what's the next one what's the, i've probably told her probably 150 times 150 stories easy oh, not wow. more of different stories and i'm like oh my god not again really you want to hear another story <laughs> jeez you know, one one radio station I worked at years and years and years ago, you know, I, I didn't operate the board. There was an engineer that operated the board, you know, and they would hand us a new, you know, commercials to read, you know, in between. And it'd be a new script. So during the commercials, I would, you know, read the uh, script over and over again, maybe five or six, seven times, you know, if I wouldn't mess up so bad, you know, reading it. And oh, yeah, yeah. the engineer thought it'd be really funny to do bloopers over the air. So and here I thought I was talking into a dead microphone, right? While, you know, you know, pre-can commercials were playing. I, I mean, everything I was saying, you know, and all the flub ups were going over the air and everybody in the station that was laughing their head off. And then, you know, afterwards they played it back and boy, I, yeah, that's why I was just asking you. No, 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 I've got, I've got little notes. I've got pay. You know, like when I do my intro and outro to my podcast or something like that, you know, just to make sure that, uh, you know, I don't have the blooper stuff happen. I'll, I'll read those off, but the rest of the stuff is just purely off the top of my head. That's so. one, one thing I like, you know, doing a podcast, uh, a podcast over a live show. You know, a lot of people go on my show and they listen to the replays and they think it's a podcast. The, I hate to say it, the, the big advantage of doing a podcast is say if you really screw up something, right? You can edit yeah. it and take it out. If I screw up, everybody's going to hear what I say, you know? <laughs> like the day my chair True. my chair broke like about two weeks ago and I found myself flying backwards. Boy, did mm -hmm. they hear some nice words. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I bet. I think the the worst thing that I have edited out of the thirteen, fourteen podcasts I've done is dead air. Uh, when somebody, you know, a couple, a couple of my guests had to go take a break for whatever reason, I edited that out. So you know, you're not listening to five minutes of me humming 
or singing to myself or something like that. But that's, well, about, that's about the worst thing. Well, you know, I have two other uh, shows I host on my network uh, uh, from uh, a different individual, like the Paranormal Lawyer. And I did also had another person on for a while, too. I decided, you know, the show wasn't working out. But he, how can I say it? He had a guest one time, right? And decided halfway through the interview to walk to the bathroom and relieve himself while he was still talking. And I tried to tell the guy <laughs> afterwards, I said, hey, you should have muted him while he was doing his, you know, nature call. Uh, and, you know, it was rather interesting. Here's going over live. Somebody's twinkling in the toilet and then flushing it while he's talking, you know, about a, about a UFO. <laughs> Uh well I haven't had that happen yet but I don't uh, I, I don't think that uh, I if I do hear that and I've got control over the board I probably would mute it too so. yeah well he didn't but that was kind of, you know I was really mad but I tell you the next day when I played it back it was rather funny <laughs> now black eyed children somebody just messaged me do you have any stories on yeah. black eyed children black eyed children. Uh, gee, let's see. Black eyed children, black eyed children. Mm, mm, mm. No, I don't have any black eyed children. I've got uh, a bunch of shadow men. I've got uh, I've got one story of a possessed demon doll. Well, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Like, let's do that. That's, that's oh, demon, okay. Yeah, demon, demon doll. Well, that's about as close as a black eyed ch- child uh, story I've got. Okay, we'll go talked- for it. Okay. Well, this one is not my personal one. Uh, this was actually one of my guests that uh, he's an Aboriginal from up in Canada, and I've talked to he's a, he's been he's become a real good friend with me, and I've talked to him hours on hours, and this guy just literally he can't stop telling me paranormal stories. He's just one right after another, rolling, 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 and he come up on uh, he's a, a real a religious guy. He follows Christ. And you can tell it just by how you tell stories. And he said he was a kid at the time. And he was in church. And one of the speakers at the church service was regaling them about uh, uh, a story of, of meeting the devil kind of deal or a bad spirit during the, the church service. And he noticed that this guy had really big, huge burns on his arm on both sides. And his mom, I think he said he was maybe nine, seven, or nine, nine years old at the time. So uh, his mom and dad was talking to the guy after service, and he kind of went into the story of how he got these burns. So on the reservation that this gentleman came from, <coughs> excuse me, he uh, there was tales of. Uh, Cryptid little people, not the not the little people you know, in society today, but cryptid little people. And there was all kinds of tales of bad spirits around them, and and the the aboriginals of the tribe would have m- meetings over sightings of this, so they would go out and do rituals and to get rid of these bad spirits and protect the the treaty land. Treaty means in Canada is aboriginal land. Sort of, sort of, kind of along that same line. So, uh, long story short, the guy uh, was a tough guy. He's one of those uh, James Bond kind of dudes, or uh, kind of guys that wouldn't take any kind of crap off of anybody. So he's rolling down the, uh, riding with a fellow uh, Aboriginal in the middle of the night on treaty land, aboriginal land, reserve land, and it's dark, and in these reserve lands, it's flat. It's like being in Illinois or Indiana, and it's all flat and dark, and you got some trees here and there throughout the, the, the place, but there's no lights on aboriginal land until you get to wherever it's populated at. So it's all more or less cow pasture land. <clears throat> so he, uh, they spot in the headlights as they're riding from where they're coming from on on the uh, on this road, this little doll runs across in front of the car, just darts across, and they slammed on the brakes, and the man that was giving the speech in the church jumps out of the car and says, I'm going to find out what this is, whether hell or high water, I'm going to prove this; these little people are real or not today. So 
So he jumps out of the car, and the man that's with him sits in the car, and he darts off into the ditch, and he follows this dog.